The second panel uh, is all about the business imperative for equality. Uh, there are five panelists again, and moderator is Sadaf Abit, one of our uh, panelists and our very dear friend uh, from London, Julia Middleton, is one of the uh, panelists uh, in this uh, second dialogue. But uh, unfortunately, her mother-in-law passed away today, and uh, she's right now busy in the funeral arrangements. She passed away because of this coronavirus impact and uh, uh, our condolences to uh, Julia and her family. And I appreciate that despite this uh, you know, tragic incident in, his, in her family, she sent the video message about her views on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are with the family in the, our sympathies are with her family and uh, rest is in peace. Uh, so I'm handing over the my uh, the, uh, further proceedings to our moderator, Sadaf Abid, for the dialogue on the evolving, the business imperative for equality. Thank over you so you, much, Sadaf. Asfar. Thank you so much, Asfar. And uh, I'd like to welcome all my panelists. A very warm welcome to you from Lahore, where I am at the moment. I want to congratulate Asfar for spearheading this initiative and for putting us all together to have a global dialogue on gender equality. As you know, the title of our discussion is the business imperative for equality. Uh, we all know there is a business case. Uh, it improves productivity, financial returns, boosts the bottom line, leads to greater engagement, lower staff over, uh, turnover, and it also improves decision-making and risk management. However, where I'd really like our panelists to focus on is, why is the pace of progress so slow? For me personally, it's just not good enough. Uh, World Economic Forum has calculated global gender parity in the workforce would take 200 years. I was there this year at Davos in January, and there was a lot of talk on, on gender equality and the business case. But the world does not see the pace of change that we would like to see. I'd like to also share with our audience that for Europe itself, reaching gender parity is estimated to take 50 years. And for North America, it's 100 plus years. So clearly what we're doing is not having the pace and the accelerated results that we hope for. And this is where I feel our panelists who come from a variety of backgrounds, experience, industries, geography, will share with us some real lessons and insights that they have seen to work, they have observed within their own industry or in terms of working with the people around them. I'll share with you my own personal experience of this issue. I grew up in Pakistan. And when I started working after I came back from Mount Holyoke, which happens to be a women's college, my mother would pick and drop me. And uh, she would wait for me. Sometimes I'd finish 5.30, sometimes 6 p.m. And I felt really bad about it. So I told my mother, I'll take the rickshaw, the tuk-tuk. Within the first month, I realized the rickshaw took 40% of my salary. I didn't want to spend so much on transport. So I jumped on a public transport. And there it saved me money, but it doubled my travel time. I had very limited seats as a woman. And I walked back home the last 20 minutes in a perfectly decent neighborhood. But that's where I realized and experienced street harassment. As a young 21 year old, I think it was critical for me to go through this experience because it showed me what millions of women face every day in emerging economies around and around the world in just making uh, their way to work. Then of course, there's the issue of uh, safety at work and well-being at work and how effective are policies in terms of supporting a diverse workforce. So with this very personal story, I'd like to really open it up to our panelists and to hear their perspectives on what more can be done and what strategies work. I'd like to start by welcoming Julie Hotchkiss, who's the executive director of People at ACCA and is leading the People Agenda over there. She has also worked in insurance, telecoms and internet. Julie, welcome. And we look forward to hearing from you. In terms of the format, we will have four to five minutes each for this discussion. And then we will be also opening it up for questions from the audience. I will be supported by Vakar, who was moderating the panel earlier. And we look forward to really having a very concise, candid 
and deep conversation in the limited time that we have together. Thank you. Thank you, Sadaf, uh, and uh, hello to everyone watching today. So um, my name is Julie Horchkus and I work for ACC, which is a professional body for accountants. Now, my organisation was founded in 1904, and actually it was founded with the intention of being inclusive and with the intention of uh, providing opportunity to all. Now, at that time, back in 1904 in the UK, the accounting profession was dominated by men. Uh, in fact, it was all men. And those men came from a very narrow social class and, and background. Therefore, ACCA was founded in order to be different, to open up that opportunity and to provide accounting education to a much broader section of society. And I'm very proud of the fact that actually the first woman accountant was admitted to ACC in 1909. So we've stayed true to that value of inclusion. And, and today, where has that taken us to? Well, we are now present in 179 countries where we have 219,000 members, of which 47% are, are women and over 500,000 students, uh, and around 58% of them are also women. Our governing body of members uh, is comprised of people from 15 countries around the world, and uh, an amazing 63% of them are women who are senior professionals in their own right uh, and in the countries that they work in. So our diverse membership really has allowed us to build a real global community and the benefits of that value of inclusion are being reaped in, in the countries that, that they work in. But that diversity is important for business. As you mentioned, it's important for talent, for employee engagement, especially of the, the younger generations. Um, but it's really important also for decision making and customer focus. Now, internally within our organisation, we also really value a, a diverse workforce and an inclusive workplace, if, especially the diversity of thought that that brings. Um, so how are we doing internally? Uh, of our executive team of seven, five of them are women, and we have about three nationalities, nationalities represented there. And amongst our whole population of managers across the organisation, 61% of them are women. And it is important to look further down the organisation and, and not just at the top. So we are having, uh, we, we are making good progress, but there's always more to do. What would I say has been our success so far? I think the first point that I would say is that diversity and inclusion is truly part of the culture. And obviously the organisation was founded on that value. But secondly, since then, there has been a genuine commitment from the leadership of the organisation, especially the, the chief executive, who is a, a woman. Um, and there's many other practical steps, but that culture and commitment from leadership uh, to demonstrate what an inclusive culture is, has really made a difference. Now, we're in very strange times and we are having to uh, take many steps to make sure that we all keep working in this, uh, in this situation that we find ourselves in around the world. And I do think in the short term, that has its challenges for some sections of, of society. Um, but also, I, I hope that in the future, we are able to retain some flexibility so that more people can have access to, uh, to opportunities. Thank you, Sada. Thank you so much, uh, Judy. Um, I think the point that I'd like to pick up from your conversation is that leadership matters and leadership's commitment, all the research that we see shows that it starts from the top. And that commitment and belief has to be driven all the way down. And I have to personally say that for someone who advocates for gender equality in Pakistan and in the region, what you've shared with me really makes me feel really proud of the great work that's happening at ACCA. I think it's, it seems definitely like an organization that really embodies this as a value and is actually living it in principle and not just doing it as a checkbox activity. And uh, let me also share with you that I love your accent. So that has been oh, a real thank you. 
Also, <laughs> I'm sure our audience is enjoying it. I, I hope our audience can understand my accent. And for anybody who is in doubt, I am from Scotland. Yes, we can tell that. <laughs> which which so, may uh, seem I, strange because the sun is shining, which is unusual. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, uh, Lahore is very sunny. Well, I want to share with all our panelists before we move that we have 26,000 26, viewers. So that is very exciting. And I'm sure this is going to grow. So what you're saying is really meaningful and important in moving the needle. I'd like to now invite uh, Robert Nicholas, from, uh, who's the managing director of 3M for Middle East and Africa, which is one of the big global companies and brings a lot of rich experience to share with us his thoughts and his ideas around the topic of gender equality and what has he seen that works. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everybody. Yes, uh, I work for 3M. We are a, an international multinational company. We are a science-based manufacturing company. Uh, and it's much easier to count the few countries that we don't uh, sell products in than it is the 200 plus uh, countries that we do sell products to. When I look at uh, the approach that we have within 3M um, around diversity and inclusion, I, I'd split it into a couple of key areas. Firstly, it's fundamental in our culture. We have five uh, pillars of culture, and one of those is powered by inclusion. The diversity for me is critical to measure because it's the measurement. It's what we need to drive because without driving that diversity, you won't change anything. But actually, the inclusion is the bit that is really important to make it work. Because just having the metrics and not really living and breathing it and making it part of how we all work doesn't make any difference. Part of that inclusion needs to be around all of the, the standard diversity metrics you'd expect, gender, um, creed, nationality, et cetera. But it's also about personalities and it's about having that inclusive uh, behavior throughout the organization. It starts at the top as, as has already been mentioned, but I think it has to go through that whole organization as well. One of the challenges I think we all face as, as companies is uh, in times when we're not recruiting at very high levels, changing some of the dynamics, changing some of the metrics around diversity becomes much harder. When I look at 3M, and I've worked for 3M in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, has been my focus for the many years I've been with 3M. And in some countries, our, our gender diversity is extremely good, and in other countries, it's not good at all. A lot of that is driven by the country, um, but it is driven by the uh, directions that we have as a company. I think it is absolutely critical, as I say, that it's through the organization and that we really uh, understand our own biases that we all have and that we all bring uh, and make sure that we are um, trying to challenge ourselves to make sure that we don't have those bi um, biases. When you're looking at recruitment, the first step for me there is to make sure that we are looking at having a very diverse candidate base that we are going to select from. Because you know, stating the blindingly obvious, if you don't have a diverse candidate base, you won't have a diverse uh, organization afterwards. I think uh, equality then links to this uh, um, aspect of inclusion. Uh, when I talk about this internally, I, I often get people to think back to when they were at school um, and if you are in an environment where teams are being picked, if you're one of the first people who always gets picked, you always feel great. If you're one of the last people who gets picked, you tend to feel somewhat isolated. Uh, and I think it's important, therefore, that we understand how we bring everybody in and get everybody um, uh, and hear everybody's voice. From a business perspective, the other aspect of this that is critical, I think, is uh, diversity is around actually understanding your customer base because our customers are incredibly diverse. Uh, you know, Generally speaking, it's about a 50-50 gender split in most countries. So if as a company we're very different from that, we probably aren't really understanding the customers and understanding the customer base that we have. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Robert, for uh, giving us a very clear picture of what is happening. And what I'd like to pick up and emphasize is I liked how you brought our attention to inclusion because diversity needs to be matched with inclusion. And that's very, very critical. You emphasize leadership 
as was emphasized by Julie, it starts from there, but we have to trickle it down, really build it within our leadership team. And actually the board also plays a key role in driving this goal. I love the fact that one of the pillars is actually inclusion because I don't see that very often, at least in Pakistan. Uh, there are some companies who are working towards that. Then metrics, because what we measure gets done. Uh, it's as simple as that. So if we're not measuring, uh, and whether this is about recruitment and looking at it in terms of diversity, promotions, retention, turnover, all of those metrics are very important. And a very interesting point that you emphasized was unconscious bias. So I'd like to share with our audience, Harvard Business School did a study and they asked uh, one room about the students. They showed a story of, uh, of a young professional, uh, they changed the names. In one they called, let's say, Mary, and in the other they called Peter. So they said, you know, Peter's a hard driving professional, he's ambitious, he wants to go ahead, and he can be tough on his teams. Um, and then the question comes whether Peter should be promoted and whether you like Peter. So when it is Peter, interestingly enough, everyone says, yes, he should get promoted, he's competent and capable, and yes, they like him. But when it is Mary, Yes, she should be promoted, but people don't like her. So there is this likability bias that women face, and which is something that women have to learn to deal with. And we, just, we have seen a trend towards greater awareness on unconscious bias and trainings, which can be helpful. I also appreciate your emphasis on looking at diversity in your customer base. If your management and board is not diverse, how are you going to reflect the diverse needs of your customer base? So that um, argument is also very important. Thank you so much. Now we will be moving towards Asma Bajwa, who's the founder of MD, uh, founder and MD of People First HR. Asma has worked extensively in British Airways, both in business and HR and training, and now runs her own advisory and consulting firm. Asma, welcome to the panel and look forward to hearing from you. Uh, you're on mute, Asma, so you will have to uh, put your mic on. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. great. Um, good evening, Sadaf. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good Good evening to all of your listeners this evening and all the other panelists. Um, and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be part of this event. Uh, my name is Asma Bajwan, and I'm the managing director of a company called People First HR Consultancy. Um, we're based in the UAE and we serve the region and beyond. We're kind of a strategic HR consulting practice. I want to start just actually by picking up uh, one of the stories that I've just heard there. I, when I was back in British Airways many, many years ago, um, I remember moving, I was a check-in agent, and um, I remember moving from a check-in agent to a supervisory a sort of uh, operational management position. And, one, and I was the only one that got the job. There was uh, you know, a lot of people ahead of me that potentially should have got the job. And one of my colleagues came and said to me, oh, but you're Asian and you have children and we expected you to be on a check-in desk for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, firsthand that kind of some of the stories I'm hearing this evening just brought that back to me. So, uh, um, you know, challenging those and kind of facing those kind of stories is something very real uh, in everyday life, I'm afraid. Now, from a theoretical and conceptual perspective, I believe that people do understand the benefits of diversity and inclusion and the importance of driving equality in the workplace. And as you have already said, um, Sadaf, there's so much research illustrating the impact on the bottom line. However, what I believe really matters is how we make this come alive and put this into practice. Um, and as an HR practitioner and consultant, um, I have the privilege of working with many, many different organizations across different industry sectors and in the region and beyond. And what I'd like to share this evening are some of the things that I see happening across the region and some of the things that I see not happening that will really help us embrace diversity, drive inclusion and equality. Now, operating in this part of the world and being based in Dubai, which has become such a global hub, uh, we benefit from such a rich diversity. However, what I found is that this in itself creates challenges for organizations when sometimes you find yourself working with people and you have up to 150 and 200 different cultures within the same organization, which I have experienced. So how can we ensure that people are treated 
with equality and their help to make them feel valued and equal at the same time. So from the work that we do, I get the opportunity to really dive deeply into different organizations, to understand some of the challenges that businesses face when embracing these concepts. Now, this isn't just from a management perspective, but also from an employee's perspective. And it's these types of insights that I think are very significant in understanding the challenges and therefore implementing practical solutions that are needed to be embedded in organizations to help them achieve equality. I do not believe that creating equality is a science. So I do ask myself, why is it so difficult to achieve this? And why does it take 200 years or 50 years to make that shift when this has been legislated and mandated in, in some countries? Um, but talking more specifically about what we do, we've helped many organizations in the region implement really important, yet very relatively simple measures that sometimes um, are difficult because of the cultural differences uh, that, that we face. And this has included simple things like equal pay for people doing the same job, regardless of where they come from, bringing about, about objective assessment methods into recruitment processes and driving fairness into performance management processes in cultures where people are not used to even giving feedback to somebody because of their wider network, they'll probably be sitting eating dinner with them in the evening. However, many organizations that have the right intent, actually, I find, struggle when it comes to implementing these things. Now, there's two reasons, key reasons for that. One, these things have a financial impact. And two, they have to change the way they do things today. So the issue in this region, particularly from my experience, is not around gender equality, as I feel we've made really good progress in this and this has been led right from the leaders of the country if I'm honest but more around the cultural inequalities that we face in, in the region. What I found in the work that I do in particular is that many organizations lack very simple practical measures that should be um, part and parcel of their day-to-day -day policies and procedures uh, in how they interact with their workforce, how they manage um, their workforce and how they reward them. All of these simple yet practical steps have to have, they have a direct impact on people's motivation and their engagement, and of course, ultimately how they will contribute to how a business performs. So I believe that we need a lot more focus in developing and implementing practical steps that are easy for people to understand, pragmatic and simple to implement, otherwise they won't get done, and of course, need to be measured. I think one other area that I'd like to see in the region, because obviously this is where I'm working, is the importance of raising awareness, providing more education and training in this area. And this is something I'd like to see more of, particularly in open public programs, for example. So not only can we help managers and leaders alike understand the business benefits, but also help them understand at a human level, the impact that individuals have on each other through their day-to-day -day interactions when it comes to people making others feel equal and valued. When we talk about Gen Z, we've done actually a lot of research um, in our company around Gen Z and what the centennial generation, um, what their expectations are. And they are actually very different from the workforce that we know today. And that includes the millennium generation. My fear is that too many organizations actually today don't really understand the differences that Gen Z will bring and therefore they're not ready to welcome and manage their expectations of this new workforce that is literally around the corner. I believe that many organizations will have to tailor their current practices to be properly prepared for this. And I think the last and final point I'd like to make is that um, in this current situation of the pandemic, this has forced a lot of organizations to um, you know, get their people to work from home. And I think I'm pretty safe in saying that in this region, this is not a common practice where people have been working remotely. However, we have been forced into this situation. And I think many organizations and clients that I'm talking to will actually explore this option of potentially offering this up as a more permanent option, recognizing that there are potential cost reductions in this. Now, this may be a trigger in this environment, which is very, very understandable. However, I hope that many leaders across the business and organizations will not only see this as an opportunity to reduce costs, but also an opportunity to allow more diversity, bring about more inclusion so that their organizations can benefit from these things. 
Thank you. Thank you, Asma. Uh, really enjoyed your insights, and I'd like to pick up a few of them. Uh, what I love is the fact that you focused on, you know, I mean, it's something that we would think that everyone gets it and you would want to do it. So why is it not happening? And how can we actually simplify it? Because the intent may be there, but I do agree with you. Many organizations struggle with even thinking, where do I begin? Where do I start? So let's really actually break it down and make it simple. The other piece I really find very valuable, you know, this can't be a once a year uh, strategy exercise. It's really something we live and breathe and dream every day. It has to run in our blood, like as managers, as leaders, as entrepreneurs, it's something we have to look at in our daily life. How am I promoting equality and diversity? So I love that focus. And uh, I'd like to share one of the uh, simple examples uh, that I've read about. Iris Bonnet, who's a professor at Harvard Kennedy School has written a book and she talks about how it's important to look at the visuals that we surround ourselves with. So I have walked into companies where I have seen that the visuals are actually only those of men. There is no diversity. There are boards that have only white men, though it's changing now. But that is very important because the signal we're giving is subliminally that you know, we're not an organization that welcomes diversity. So start with even something simple as that, the pictures that are around in your office, in your organization. Secondly, I wonder what all of you think about manners, a panel with only men. Again, that's a small step, but it can give the right signal out from your organization that diversity matters. So when you invite speakers in, make sure it's a diverse group. When you're giving funding, make sure it's a, it promotes diversity. Um, I also appreciate the fact that there is a whole human and heart side to this. You know, there is a, there is a side where we really have to believe in this and feel it in our body that this is something I value. Like I value integrity. I value, you know, I don't know, learning, self-growth. I value equality and diversity. So how can we build that in? And then a very interesting element on Generation Z. And we know that, that they actually are much more plugged into uh, diversity and inclusion. So they're going to be entering the workforce and they will want to see this change. So how are we prepared for that? So thank you so much for all of these uh, wonderful uh, tactics and ideas and giving us approaches to think about. So we will now move on to Edie, and uh, Edie is an entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman, and she's an advocate for women's advancement. So looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your insights on this topic. Well, thank you, Sadaf. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I'd like to thank Mohammed and Nutshell for inviting me. And I actually come out of the cruise industry. I was CEO for the world's leading luxury cruise line for many years and chairwoman for another brand uh, in the cruise industry. So I've had a 35 plus year career. It's been wonderful. And one of those women, as we say, who has been fortunate enough to shatter the glass ceiling, ceiling and getting to the sea. CEO ranks. I'm also an American from New York based in South Florida, but I am a global executive, C-suite executive. So it's been a, a fantastic career, but I will tell you from my own Genesis, it's, it's definitely a struggle. 30 plus years ago, diversity in the global workplace that is today was not then. And it didn't mean it was impossible. It just meant it was a little bit more challenging. And we as women had to work harder, if you will. And I was very fortunate because I had parents who told me uh, I was one of five kids as a young child, you can be whatever you want to be. So I never saw diversity and never had subliminally fear that you couldn't do something. If you worked hard, got a great education and followed your passion, you should be able to do whatever you want in this life, in this world. And um, I think I'm, I'm saddened somewhat that we are still in 2020 in this year and we are still discussing this issue of diversity. And there are many nations, whether you take Iceland as an example or France, where they require from a government legal standpoint that diversity be implemented, that percentages be women, uh, people of color, 
et cetera. And I always say no chairman ever hired me because of my gender. They hired me because they thought I was the best person for the position. And I think that that's how the professional business world globally has to look at it. It absolutely positively has to start with leadership at the board level. And, you know, in America, we had this board initiative 2020 by the year 2020, have 20% of boards be women. And isn't it a shame that it had to take an initiative to get it to that. But that is the reality. And it is still a hardcore reality today in 2020. Additionally, um, where does it begin? In my humble personal and professional opinion, it begins absolutely positively with the leadership at the board level, at the CEO level, at the C-suite level. And it is so important to have a board and a CEO that embraces that, that truly wants it, that makes it part of the corporate keep KPIs from the bottom down and from, from excuse me, from the top down and from the bottom up. It is absolutely critical. And uh, there are many leaders in this day and age that I admire that I personally think are doing a great job of that. And one I would like to highlight, because I think he sets a global benchmark and standard really second to none. And that is Mark Benioff from Salesforce. I actually saw in America, we have a program 60 Minutes. He was actually interviewed and I was really uh, so fascinated and impressed with his style and ideas and what he actually not only walked the walk and talked the talk, but he actually put his money where his mouth is. And so he met with his head of HR, which is such an important foundation. Again, leadership, board level, CEO level, and then taking that HR leader and making sure they understand and implementing that as pillars of the organization, as KPIs for the organization, so that it does trickle down throughout. And what he did, the first question he asked that HR person in the interview I saw was how much is it going to cost me? And she was very candid. She said, it's going to cost sev several millions of dollars annually to implement this, to bring the female leaders up to equal pay scale with their male counterparts, et cetera, et cetera. And he didn't care. He said, just do it. Now, of course, they were a profitable company in pre-pandemic good times. But the bottom line is he really was passionate about it, believed in it. And he it had he created that for his company. So I think companies around the world should really look at he and what he did with his organization as a global standard and a benchmark and try to implement. But it is not only a matter of the KPIs and the leadership and putting their money where their mouth is, because it will cost more in training and implementation in bringing the payroll up to equal pay. Um, and it's not only about women and male versus female gender equality. It's about equality across the board, color, um, gender, sexual orientation, we really should be able to look at a candidate without knowing what they look like, what their name is, so that when you're looking at that CV and you're looking at that job description, before you even get to the interview process, you are trying to get a candidate pool that meets the criteria regardless if they are male or female, black or white, transgender, straight, gay, you know, from your hometown, from a country you love or not. And so it's going to take a massive um, sort of ethos from the ground up, but it can be done. And while we have made great strides, we haven't even scratched the surface in my opinion. And a case in point by that, I mean, is look at the number of females on global board of directors to this day. There's still not enough. There really is not true equal gender diversity while they have made great strides and look at the fortune and forbes ceo list of female ceos i have to tell you at that coveted position of a ceo instead of it getting a higher percentage for women it is actually decreasing year over year so we have a myriad of challenges ahead but if everybody's heart and mind are in the right place and we are willing and mean it sincerely and are not doing it because of either government regulation or things of that nature, we will get there. But I believe it begins and ends with the board, the CEO, and the HR, and making it KPIs and key pillars of any organization. Thank you.
Edie, thank you so much for such a passionate, uh, you know, description for us from your experiences. And I like how you frame it. It begins and ends with the board and the CEO and the leadership team. I think that has been emphasized by all the panelists, it has to start from the top. And yes, I share your thing about it's 2020 and we're still talking about this and the numbers mm -hmm. keep getting worse. I mean, WEF estimated yes. last time it would take like 170 years. Now they've increased it to 200 years. So it's like we're adding 30, 40 years every year. So something's yes. not going right. Iceland, wonderful example. Sweden, Norway, yeah, yes, we can learn a lot from these countries. We have to be willing to invest in it. I think that's an important message you mm -hmm. brought out. You know, we have to invest in it. And yes, there will be dividends for your company and for your people and greater uh, productivity innovation, equal pay, critical for us to look at, look at. And then, of course, the unconscious bias. We look at a CV, you look at age, gender, ethnicity, and there's things going on in your head and you're not even aware of it. Yes. Every human has unconscious bias. It's a reality. So uh, these, have to, these systems have to be developed. They have to be institutionalized. I'll share something with you. My prior life, I, I was running a microfinance organization. We built it from two rooms and it was two women in leadership roles. We started as an all women's team because we felt it was important for women to work with women from the bottom of the pyramid. And as we started growing and open, opening it up, we started hiring a lot of men because we got, got more male applicants. And we looked at our numbers in a few years and guess what? from a 100% women-based organization, we had gone down to only 20% women. And I learned a big lesson from that. What it told me was just having a female leader does not mean that you're going to have a diverse, inclusive organization. You've got to build those systems in place. You've got to have those yes. metrics in place and you've got to measure and talk about that commitment. So that was a great, great uh, lesson. So thank you so much. I'm going to actually introduce some questions that we've received from our uh, audience. We have 25,000 plus uh, people who are listening to us. And my co-facilitator, Vakar, has just shared with me, what are the key differences between diversity, inclusiveness, and equality? Is, uh, is anyone who would like to take this on? Maybe we can hear one view and something short, like two minutes. I, I could maybe answer that yes. one. Um, sure. I, I, I heard a, a fantastic phrase, uh, which is diversity is being invited to the ball. Uh, inclusion is being asked to dance. So that's the difference. Diversity is just being wow. there, but inclusion nice. is actually being part of it and being asked to dance when you attend that ball. Um, and to me, equality is then the outcome that we are seeking to to achieve that opportunity is available to all and that people are treated fairly and equally. Love it. Well, well said. Well said, <laughs> super. Yes, so diversity is being invited to that dance. Uh, inclusion is when you're actually dancing and enjoying and having a great time. And then equality is the outcome. I'm gonna tweet this later. <laughs> and I want to actually invite all our audience, please do follow Nutshell on Twitter and do look up all our uh, panelists. I'm, I'm sure several of you are on Twitter and I hope we're going to become friends after this. The next question I'd like to uh, bring out is, would anyone from our panel uh, uh, like to bring out the correlation and any evidence that you've come across on DNI and how it leads to more innovation and to building a more creative company? I do have the stats on my own, but if anyone would like to highlight this, I'm happy to offer it to our panelists. So, uh, so Boston Consulting Group has done a study where they have actually shown that more diverse teams actually not only re uh, lead to higher revenues, the link is really, so they're, they're estimated 19% higher revenues due to in innovation in particular. So. I must congratulate myself for having these stats with me at this moment. So uh, I would like to bring our attention to another topic, which I'm very curious, how does our group of panelists really think about it? So 
we are all part of society. We grew up, grew up in a family. And I think equality, and as uh, Edie also talked about it, you got the message from your family that you could do anything or be anything. And I got the same message from my family growing up in Pakistan in a, in a military background. But it took me a year to convince my dad to send me abroad for my master's. And I have also observed in my extended family that a young boy, girl are you know, running, they're, they're running fast, they fall. And everyone says to the boy, oh, it's not a big deal, run, run, go ahead. And to the girl, it said, why were you running so fast? I told you to be careful. So I want to ask you to tell me, what do you think do we need to do differently in raising girls and boys? Because the family unit plays a very important role in all these messages. So that's a great point. And if I can chime in here, as the mother of a son, um, and I have many nieces and nephews, not only to your point of the example of the little boy and girl running, but they would also not help the boy up. They'd expect him to get up on his own, but they'd run over to the little girl who was yeah. fragile, who was maybe told you're gonna grow up and marry a yeah. prince and you need to be helped up. Let me help you up. Oh, are you okay? And you know, th there are a lot of these inherent things, particularly from generations past. Maybe it's ease now, um, but what I would say is that we are different. The reality is God did make us different. And we should embrace those differences. But from a cerebral and an intellectual standpoint, we can be equal and some can be smarter than others regardless of it. And I also think that I, I think multitasking is a misnomer because we think we can multitask, but really it's not maybe getting the quality to each endeavor. But I think that women can juggle perhaps a lot more balls at one time than perhaps men can. And I hate being uh, biased and saying that. It's just been my own experience. It's watching my own husband, watching my own son, and then watching females. But I think that it does have to start in the family life with sort of a neutrality. And if you've been fortunate enough to be raised in a family where there are boys and girls and, you know, it, it adds to it. But when you're a single gender family, maybe they're not exposed to it as much. And then when they go to school, they start to see the differences. But there are clear differences and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not saying that diversity means, as an example, starting out in New York 38 years ago, when I would go to work, we would wear business suits that looked very masculine because you wanted to show the boys on the street, Wall Street or at the table, that you were equal to them. So dress was a subliminal way to do it. You know what? Now, I really don't care. When I go to a business meeting, I put on whatever designer dress I want, and I'm proud to be a female. And it's always the professional look, but it's not that rigid male business suit of yesteryear. So it is evolving. It is changing. But I guess it's a long-winded way to say that we, we are different, and there's nothing wrong with being different. We can still be equal and, and try to be who is the, the best candidate or the best person for this project? Because maybe they have the right skill set and experience and are cerebral enough. But it's not to say that it should be a male versus a female. Again, what is the effort you're looking for and who brings the right experience? Being neutral. Thank you. And, and Sadaf, if, if I can just, uh, apologies, if yes. I can just add a, a couple of other very quick points as well. Uh, firstly, sure. Your um, question around bringing children up, for me, uh, and I've got uh, children, two children, one male, one female, um, it's around bringing children up. It's not about bringing sons up or daughters up. They are children. Yes. They're children first, they're children last, and they have their own personalities. Um, yes. The other aspect I would throw in here is the one of the things about diversity is celebrating our differences because we are different and we do not want to be the same. We don't want everybody to be the same. That to me isn't a diverse environment and a diverse society or a diverse company. I want to embrace those differences. I want certain things like a code of conduct as we have in, in 3M where everybody treats everybody with respect, but I also want to celebrate those differences, harness those yes. differences and include those differences. And that's what makes us as a, um, a company or us as a society much stronger. Well said. Thank you.
Well yeah, said. I think, uh, Sadaf, if I can just come in there on one point, I think uh, to both of the panelists in terms of em embracing difference, differences is absolutely key. But I think in terms of in society and when you're bringing up children, I think it's the outcome that you mustn't lead them to believe that will be different necessarily because they can still achieve, they can, you know, uh, because you're a girl, you are going to be different or because you're a, but what you can achieve, that doesn't affect that. So I think it's really important at a very early age for, from everybody in the society that we interact with is to really encourage people to be the best that they can and really um, you know, embrace that, welcome that, and allow people to grow for who they are and what they are, as opposed to saying, limiting the belief of what they can do. Because I think that's really, really important. Totally Thank agree. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will now uh, sum up what I have found personally to be a very invigorating conversation. And I'm personally inspired by all the panelists and the ideas that they have brought forward. So if I sum it up, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll start by saying it starts with the leadership. So we have to have a board, a, a leader, the CEO and the management team that really believes in driving equality, diversity and inclusion. And then it, I like this aspect of keeping it simple. You know, don't make it too complicated and really look at daily actions, daily habits, daily behaviors, actions, that you can take to move the needle forward. And each one of us has a role to play. Third is about embracing differences. And not just even embracing them, but as we spoke about, Robert talked about, celebrating them, really celebrating them. And uh, I, I must say that it's not as simple. In many cultures, it's hard for people to celebrate differences because they're not used to it. It can make you uncomfortable, but we know this, growth happens when you're in the uncomfortable zone. So, so do that. Number four is having metrics. We must have metrics in place and let's start looking at equal pay and what's happening around that. Many companies are measuring it and going for change. And number five that I would emphasize is the piece that got talked about unconscious bias. We all have it. Let us be more aware of it and let us move in a direction where we can build systems and processes so we avoid unconscious bias. And in the end, I'd like to uh, go back and have uh, Julie repeat the last, me the, the great message that you came up with. What is diversity, inclusion and equality? Okay, so uh, diversity has been invited to the dance. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And the outcome is equality, fairness and opportunity. And why I'm ending on this is because I think if we keep this principle in our mind every day, whether in our family or in our work environment, you know, am I inviting people around me to be a part of something, whether it's a team meeting, a discussion, a new product being developed, how inclusive is that gathering? And then it's really about asking people to contribute. Research shows many times women will not share their ideas. They often underestimate themselves. There is the, a lot of data on, on confidence gap. A man looks at uh, you know, promotion. He, he says, I'm good at you know, three out of five. I'm going to go for it. Woman looks at the same thing, says, I have to get better. I must practice more, work hard, then I'll apply. So we need to understand these uh, trends also. But as managers, as leaders, as those who believe in creating a more equal world, we can push the needle on this and play an active role. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, to Thank Julie, Robert, Asma, Edie, it's been a pleasure. This has been an amazing panel from all over the world. I wish you all the best in driving this goal forward because you matter and what you're doing matters to making this world a better place for all so we can thrive. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Bye, Thank you so everybody. Much. I will be now giving it to Asfar to take us forward.